Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Janina Jeff, staff bioinformatics scientist at Illumina, and I have the pleasure today of speaking with Dr. Marilyn Ritchie. Marilyn, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Marilyn Ritchie. I am a professor in the Department of Genetics at the University of Pennsylvania. I am also the director of the Institute for Biomedical Informatics and the vice president for research informatics at the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Thanks for joining us today, Marilyn. It's so great to see you. Yes, like I'm so excited to talk about the future. We just got a really big announcement here at Illumina. Yeah. We're in the genome era. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so I just want to hear, like, what are some of your like uh, bold predictions mm -hmm. of genomics, maybe in the next 10 years? in 20 years. You were like, wow, maybe someday we'll actually have whole genome sequence on people that we're studying. And now that's like old news. Yes, yeah, it's normal. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that the future is going to be a combination of the genome era and the bioinformatics era coming together. The technology's gotten there for the generation of multi-omics data, which is something that I've been talking about probably for 10 years. Like, wouldn't it be great if someday we had DNA variation, but also gene expression and proteomics and metabolomics because complex diseases are complicated and probably to model them effectively, we need to look at not just the inherited variation of the DNA, but what is happening at gene expression, what is happening to the protein expression, what's happening to epigenetics, and try to build computational and machine learning models that put it all together. And that's where the genomics era merges with the bioinformatics era. You know, machine learning and AI is now at a point with, you know, computational scale computing that we can actually start to put all those things together. And what I'm most excited about is trying to figure out how do you do that on different patient populations? So where in one set of people you have DNA and epigenetics, and in another set of people you have maybe uh, metabolomics and gene expression, could we analyze them together and actually do some sort of machine learning to bring those data sets together to really harness the power of all these data sets? Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you. I feel like bioinformatics is something that we don't talk about enough when we talk about these big announcements in genetics. And every time there is one, bioinformatics is an afterthought. Yeah. Everybody calls the bioinformatician after their study's done. Like, hey, can you save my study and actually find something? Right. <laughs> and sometimes the answer is no, there's, there's nothing here. Um, but a lot of times, you know, it comes to how do we, how do we even develop the skill set to analyze it? And so you brought up machine learning which I think is going to be a huge part of the future, and specifically like multi-omics applications. What type of insights do you think that we're going to learn, or what do you think the low-hanging fruit is going to be, or maybe this is already known, from multi-omics studies? So I think a lot of the machine learning is going to require using expert knowledge, and there's a lot of both kind of non-for-profit and companies that have been putting together these amazing databases of prior knowledge, I think that is going to be kind of the low-hanging fruit is taking that as expert knowledge with machine learning because the search spaces, spaces for these data sets is just huge. And yeah. so just throwing it all into machine learning and like hitting a button and hoping it finds something, I think, I don't think we're quite there yet. But I think if we use the expert knowledge to guide some of the search, it's not going to find everything. We're certainly going to miss, you know, the regions of the genome that we still don't know what they do or what they are. We're not going to find those. Um, the kind of micro RNAs that we don't know what cell types they're important for, like we might not get those, but it will allow us to put together a lot of the multi-omics data and actually find these more sophisticated machine learning models that are predictive of disease risk, which like I said, it's not going to find everything, yeah. but if we could just start to find something that yeah. turns into therapeutics, like that's the vision of some of the talks we've been hearing. Like that's where we want to go and find the cures for things like heart disease and autoimmune disease and not just cancer. So, last question, you know, with that in mind, you have been a leader, you have created, you know, some really great things over the course of your career, and you've seen a lot of things that have happened in the course of your career in genomics. Um, over the last 20 years, what has been like the biggest finding in, you know, genomics where you're like, this changed my life? I, re I do remember one time. And I'll just say this one time, you were really excited. We were at Vanderbilt. I was in Dana's office, who was my PhD advisor. Mm -hmm. And you walked in with a USB hard drive. And it was, I think it was 
uh, the first genome-wide data for like, I don't know, a thousand people just on this USB-C hard drive. <laughs> and you were so excited. I think it was the first um, Biome data or something like that. You were so excited. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. <laughs> and like now we're talking about sequencing, you know, mm -hmm. thousands of samples um, pretty fast. So like a lot has happened. What has been kind of like big things in genomics wow. that you were like, wow. So that is definitely one, yeah. the ability to generate the data. So I don't feel that old. Like, I don't think we're that old. No, we're not but old. We were just young. <laughs> we were super young. But if you think back, my PhD project, which I defended in 2003, which is like going to be 20 years ago, right, was 25 SNPs studying sporadic breast cancer. That was a big data set in 2003, which is cute now. So I think the ability to generate the data, like I could have never imagined that when I started out, that we would have data sets of millions of variants and all these other data types. Like it just, that I think has been transformational over the course of our careers. Thank you so much for talking to us oh, today. It was great to talk yes, to you. Yes, thank you.